Welcome to lecture number three and lecture number four. In these lectures, we will talk about the morphology of permanent incisors. As we have earlier discussed, that a human dentition is a diophyodont dentition, which means I have, we have a primary dentition, which is also called a deciduous or a predecessor dentition which starts to erupt when we uh, almost six months old and finish to finish to erupt when we are 28 plus minus four months of our lives they shed starting from uh, the six years of uh, life till we are 12 years old the secondary and also called the permanent or the successor dentition erupts starting from age 6 till we are 18 sometimes uh, the molar especially the third molar uh, is a little bit delayed in eruption can erupt until 25 years old stages of human dentition we live an edential stage which means we don't have teeth in our mouth from zero to six months of life eruption of primary dentition it starts at six months and stays till two and a half sometimes three years of life the functioning primary dentition from two and a half or three years till six years the mixed dentition which means we have in both primary and secondary t uh, dentitions in our oral cavity from 6 to 12 years the permanent dentition starts when we are 12 years old the full permanent dentition is when we reach 18 to 25 years old and that's as I have explained because sometimes the third molars <coughs> stay <coughs> uninterrupted till we are 25 years old We are going to talk about some terms that we are going to use in this lecture and in the lectures coming. Some of them I have already explained, but we will just go through them again. So the dental arch, we have two arches, the maxillary and the mandibular. Tooth class, we said that we have uh, <coughs> four different teeth classes, the incisor, which have or has incisor edge, the canine that has one pointed cusp, the premolar or called the bicuspid because it has two cusps, and the molars that have three or more flattened cusps. We have some traits that we can identify to teeth by. For example, when we say, say set a trait, that means we are identifying this tooth to be a deciduous or a permanent tooth. The arch trait, which means we are defining this tooth according to which jaw it locates in. Is it a maxillary or a mandibular tooth? The class trait I just have explained here. And the type trait, which means which actually tooth is this within a class. For example, is it a first molar, a second, third? It is a central incisor, a lateral incisor, and so on. I just wanted to uh, mention that all the glossary we talked about last uh, lecture and in this lecture, they are all found at the end of your book in the glossary. We have already explained all these uh, terms but if you want uh, to have the definitions grouped together you can find them in the glossary at the end of the book we are going to talk about again some terms that we use to describe anterior teeth I hope you remember these terms that we use last lecture the surfaces, the line angles, the point angles, the incisal edge, the cusp, 
singulum, fossa, region marginal ridges, cervical line, lobe, mammalian, lingual pit, developmental groove, divisions into thirds and contact points. All these terms will be used to describe the incisors in this lecture. Remember dividing teeth into thirds? It was the last thing I explained in the last lecture. Also, we are going to use these divisions to talk about uh, certain features we can see in the anterior teeth. So, putting these terms in mind, we can start now to talk about the permanent incisors. Which incisors erupt first? As you can see here, I have to use the FDI system to give you the numbers of the teeth because on computer I can't put vertical and horizontal line to write in the Palmer system way. So if you remember, each arch is having a number in the permanent dentition, it was one two, three, and four, and each tooth is having a number right to the quadrant number. So if four, one, and four, three are the first to erupt, that means the central, the mandibular centrals are first to erupt. Then the maxillary centrals, then the mandibular laterals and then the maxillary laterals. What does actually incisors do inside our oral cavity? They function in cutting, of course aesthetic, and they help in speech. Some uh, letters cannot be spelled or cannot be uh, 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 spelled out of mouth without using tongue with incisors. Class traits, which means there are some features that are exclusive for this kind of class or to incisors. So the incisal two thirds are flattened mesodistally, which means this two third is almost flat of the tooth and it's compressed labiolingually as you can see here. Incisors have a long horizontal mesodistal biting edge. In other words, we have a long incisal edge. Sometimes we can see mammillons, two or more mammillons on the incisal edge. And the marginal ridges of this tooth is parallel to the long axis. These are the marginal ridges, if you remember from last lecture. If you don't, it would be really useful for you just to read the terms again from the last lecture. And this is the long axis of the tooth. They are parallel to the long axis of the tooth. As you can see it from proximal surface too. If we talk about the maxillary incisors, there is difference between the central and the lateral incisor, which we call the type trait. For example, the, ma the maxillary central incisor has the first evidence of calcification between three to four months while the lateral has the first evidence of calcification at one year. Enamel is completed between four and five years in the central. It's the same for the lateral. The central erupts between seven and eight years, the lateral eight to nine years. 
the route is completed around 10 years in the lateral it's about 11 years we will start talking about the permanent maxillary incisor we will talk first about the arch trait which means these are special features that seen only in maxillary incisors the crown is wider mesodistally as you can see the width of the crown mesodistally is of course wider than its buccolingually or labolingually and we can uh, say that this tooth is wide because the mesodistal dimension is also uh, bigger than the incisal cervi the cervical incisal uh, measure of this tooth the root is also wider mesodistally than labiolingually And it's conical in shape in the central incisors at least so the type trait uh, before we go to type trait maybe we should just mention as you can see this is the maxillary and this is the mandibular incisor how is the mandibular incisor mesodistal dimension are really smaller than the labiolingual ones for the crown and for the root that's what I mean by the arch trait that is it's different in the maxillary than the mandibular also for the mesodistal dimension for the uh, for the mandibular according to its height it's smaller in the maxillary the mesodistal to the uh, height is bigger or higher anyway we don't have to explain the uh, mandibular incisor in this, uh, now we will go to that later the type trait which means what is the difference between the central and the lateral incisor the size is different the height to width the proportion of the crown this is the height which is the measurement from the cervical line to the incisor edge and the mesodistal to labiolingual proportion in crown and root we will go to into the details uh, later the permanent maxillary central incisors we will talk about the morphology of this tooth from all five aspects to start with the labial aspect we should say that this tooth has the widest mesodistal dimension of all teeth and you can see that only by looking at your teeth in the mirror this is a type trait special for the central maxillary incisor sometimes we see three mammalums from the labial side usually the middle one is the smallest But it's, it's not always the same. We, do, we don't see mammalons in all central teeth. If we see them, we will have two labial groups separating the mammalons. So if you look from the uh, mesial side, and as you can see, the directions are written here. But later you will be able to know which tooth and which direction is this without looking at... Uh, the letters or the, the dimensions written on the page so mesial uh, meso incisal line angle as you can see here is a sharp it makes almost 90 degrees it's also a type trait the distal incisal line angle as you can see is round and of course you figured out by now that this tooth 
is the lift maxillary central incisor. The mesial contour is straight because of this and the distal contour is round because of this of this uh, line angle shape. Anyway, tooth converge cervically in both sides which means that cervical area is uh, smaller go getting smaller than the incisal edge. Remember we talked about something called contact point also called height of contour which means the point where the teeth actually uh, contact each other. So mesial, at mesial side of the central incisor teeth contact each other here in the incisal third and the distal height of contour is the junction is here and that is the junction between the uh, incisal third and the middle third as you can see the root is conical and inclined distally a little bit the lingual aspect you can see a scoop like surface which means there is a lingual fossa in the lingual surface it's here this is the lingual fossa that gives us the scoop like surface this lingual surface uh, this lingual fossa is surrounded by the marginal ridges and the cingulum If you remember all these terms from last lecture the root is narrower from the lingual side the mesial aspect you can see a chisel shape because of the lingual fossa on the lingual surface labially the height of contour which in the mesial and the distal uh, aspects we say height of contour but it's not a contact point which means it's only the widest point uh, on the surface so the height of contour in the cervical is in the cervical third as you can see almost here the height of contour the widest point of the tooth the uh, cement enamel junction is curved incisally as you can see going in the incisal direction in the labial and lingual it headed toward the root as you can see here so the cemento enamel junction of the central incisor is the most pronounced that is also a type trait the uh, incisal edge coincides with the long axis of the tooth which means if we draw a line in the half of the tooth it will go through the incisal edge and the half of the tooth they will coincide together the root is conical as you can see you can see here again the contact areas in the mesial which is in the incisal third and it is in the junction between the incisal and the middle thirds distally the distal aspect the cemento enamel junction is not as much curved as in the mesial side And there is little differences between the mesial and the distal aspects. Sometimes when you look from the distal side, you have the illusion that 
this tooth is thicker that's because because the teeth incline in the arch to take the shape of the arch so sometimes you see more of the labial surface from the distal side not because you do really see it's just because it tilts with the arch it's not something really important to know the incisal aspect this is the fifth aspect to describe in this tooth it has a triangular outline as you can see we can almost draw a triangle around it the labial surface obviously convex to imagine this aspect you just have to look at your teeth uh, like you are looking from down the mesial outline is longer than the distal outline which is something hardly noticed it's really hardly noticed you can see some of the lingual surface and you can see of course the labial uh, sorry the incisal edge this is the incisal edge so what I would like you to do is to go back to the book and take a look of all the pictures of uh, different aspects of this tooth and try to uh, recognize the features we talked about today on these pictures this is very important and you can also come to the lab to see some natural center incisors there and some sculptures we did for them the permanent maxillary lateral incisor the crown closely resembles that of the central incisor and they supplement the central incisor in, the, in their function they are smaller in all dimensions except the root length they vary in form more than any other tooth in the mouth except for the third molar if the variation is too great it's considered a developmental anom anomaly anomaly for example the big shaped lateral it's a common anomaly which the tooth has a pointed non-descriptive form as you can see in this picture as you can see in this picture this is a big shaped lateral one of the most common anomalies that can happen in the lateral incisor in this picture you can see just how the crowns solve the problem In some individuals, these teeth are missing. And sometimes we can find something called palato gingival groove or palato radicular groove or interruption groove in the uh, lingual surface, in the lingual fossa of the lingual surface of these teeth. We will see uh, one of them just in a minute. Some of the common malformations in this tooth are the presence of large pointed tubercle as a part of the cingulum, <laughs> tuberculum dentali, a deep developmental groove that extends down on the root lingually with a deep fold in the cingulum, a twisted root, a distorted crown. In this patient, as you can see, the laterals are missing here we can see the palato uh, reticular groove it starts on the lingual surface lingual pit and the groove goes down to the root which is like a, a good really place for the plaque and the bacteria to accumulate and cause caries So let's talk about this, the lateral incisor from the five aspects. The labial aspect. From the labial aspect, as we can see, it is not, 
has a smaller mesodistal dimension and is shorter inside the cervical. It's more rounded in, ger in general. The mesoincisal angle and the distoincisal angles are more rounded than that in the central incisor. Also, the mesial and distal outlines, which means the shape of the mesial and the distal surfaces, in general, they are more rounded. The height of contour, or the contact points, mesially, is between the middle and the incisal thirds. If we make thirds, almost it will be like here, mesially, and it's in the middle of the middle third, <coughs> in the distal side. The root is conical and slightly inclined distally. Sometimes can, that can help us to know the direction. As I have said, the tooth is almost 2 mm narrower mesodistally than the central incisor and shorter by 2 to 3 mm cervical incisally or incisor cervically. The root is about one and a half times longer than the crown and it tapers evenly from the cervical line to two thirds its length and in most cases it curves sharply from this area in a distal direction and it ends in a pointed apex. There is some times where the root ends straight or sometimes curved mesially. The lingual aspects, the marginal ridges of the tooth are more pronounced, also the cingulum. The lingual fossa accordingly is deeper, which is logic. If the walls are higher, then the valley will be if the mountains are higher, then the valley is uh, more deep. As I said, sometimes we can see a pit here with a developmental radicular groove. The incisal ridge is more developed and the lingual fossa is more concave. The incisal edge is more developed. The mesial aspect, the cingulum is more convex than the central incisor. The cement to enamel junction is less curved. It is similar to the central except that the root is longer, the crown is shorter, and the labiolingual measurement is smaller. At, as, and the cemento enamel uh, junction is less curved, as I have mentioned. The uh, incisal uh, ridge appears a little bit thicker than of the central, because it's more developed, as I have mentioned earlier. The root appears tapered, cone-shaped, the plant apex, and that can vary, sometimes it's pointed. Also, as in the incisor, in the max central incisor, root, uh, the line in the middle of the tooth bisects the incisal edge or ridge. The distal aspect, the width of the crown distally appears thicker for the same reason we have early, uh, already explained in the central incisor. The curvature of the CAJ is less than on the mesial surface, as you can see. Sometimes we can see a developmental groove 
uh, in this aspect that extends to the root. The incisal aspect, when you look from the incisal aspect, we can see that it's almost ovoid in shape, ovoid round in shape. Mesodistally, it's smaller than the central. Labial outline is rounded, as you can see. The mesolingual and distolingual line angles are more rounded, as you also can see. The cingulum may be large because it's more prominent, as we have already explained. So we can see more of the cingulum from this aspect. And the uh, incisor edge also is more prominent. I would like you also to go back to the book to know exactly the measurements of the tooth. You will use it in the lab to carve the teeth. So it would be uh, important for you to go back to the book and know the measurements of each tooth we are going to talk about in the lab. And also take a look at the pictures to uh, know or be familiar with all the features that we talked about. Also, um, you can come to the lab to see natural lateral incisors and sculptures of them. So that was the end of lecture number three. But I would like to continue with lecture number four about the man permanent mandibular incisors because I find it useful actually to uh, learn them together. You will be able more to, uh, com to make comparisons. Comparisons always make it easier to understand and memorize the differences between teeth, which will help you in identifying them later in the future, whether in the uh, teeth of uh, in the lab when you see teeth out of the oral cavity or in the oral cavity when you have uh, some shifted teeth or missing teeth. Anyway, let's start talking about the mandibular incisors. So again, we will mention some of the arch traits, which means that they are uh, especially they are special for the mandibular incisors. I just mentioned that at the beginning of the lecture, they are narrower mesodistally if we compare it to the maxillary. They have a greater height to width proportion, which means they are long. The centrals were wide. The maxillaries are wide, the mandibular are long. They have smaller mesodistal to labiolingual uh, proportion, which means labiolingually they are thicker. The root is smaller mesodistally to labiolingually, that is obvious. <clears throat> and they are generally oblong in cross section. I will show you a picture just in a minute. The type trait which means the difference between the central and the lateral, they nearly equal in size and dimensions, the central and the lateral mandibular incisors. So, let's talk about the permanent mandibular central incisor. From the labial aspect, it has the narrowest mesodistal dimension of all incisors. It's bilaterally symmetrical. This is a type trait, which means a midline a line. Oh, that was not really a midline. Anyway, if you if you write if you uh, draw a midline in the tooth, it's almost identical. The mesial and the distal are almost identical. Sometimes we see C three mammalons. Uh, on the incisal edge of this tooth. The mesioincisal and the distoincisal line angles are sharp. They are almost 90 degrees and they are at the same level. 
both height of contours are within the incisal thirds. As you can see here, the height of contour or the contact point, which is the widest uh, di uh, diameter of the tooth, are within the incisal thirds. The outlines of the mesial and distal, they are almost straight. The outlines, as you can see, this is what I'm talking about. This is the outline of mesial and the cell thirds. They are almost straight. The cement to enamel junction, convex cervically. The root is narrow and conical, as you can see. The lingual aspect, the lingual fossa is really shallow because the marginal ridges and the cingulum are really also uh, not prominent. They are not well developed. The marginal ridges and the cingulum. The cement to enamel junction summit in the center. In the center. The permanent mandibular central incisor as seen from the mesial aspect, the height of contour is within the cervical third as you can see. I think right now we are familiar with this, I don't have to divide the teeth into three thirds to explain this. From the height of contour to the incisal edge, it's almost straight, almost. The root, of course, the height of contour uh, lingually is the same within the cervical third. The root is broad and flat, and a shallow depression is seen in the mid portion. If any of these uh, illustrations are not really well uh, seen here in the sh in the demonstration, you can just open your book and follow. Uh, on the photos and pictures and illustrations that's found there. It's a void in the cross section, which means if we cut the root like this, we can see an ovoid shape, as you can see here. The distal aspect, it's the same, just the cement to enamel junction is either skirt. The incisal aspect, it's a triangular in shape, as you can see. The labial surface is more flat. If you, if you go back to the central incisor, it was more convex, sorry, convex. This one is a little bit flat, the labial surface. And the long axis of the incisal edge is perpendicular to the uh, labiolingual line, which means this is the axis of the incisal edge, and this is the labiolingual axis. They are perpendicular to each other. This is important uh, because that will be different in the lateral incisor. The mesial and distal outlines, they are almost the same. As I said, this tooth is symmetrical when you divide it. The pulp of this tooth is broad labiolingually and narrow mesodistally, which means it follows the dimensions of the root as I have described them. It's really hard to tell is this tooth a right or a left when it's seen outside the oral cavity because this tooth is symmetrical when you divide it into mesial and distal aspects. Some of the variation can happen in this tooth. Uh, but it's really, really rare. So it's considered one of the most consistent teeth in the mouth. As you can see here, if you don't, didn't get it, that uh, this is the pulp from the proximal surface, it's broad, and this is the pulp from uh, a labial or a lingual aspect. It's really narrow. Go back to the book and see the illustrations and the drawings, also the 
photos of natural mandibular central incisors try to apply all the features we've talked about on these pictures so you'll have better understanding and you can imagine um, you'll be able to imagine these features you'll have better understanding about these features and these teeth the lateral incisor we don't have a lot of differences between the central and the lateral mandibular incisors so the labial surface is slightly wider than the central one but it's not bilaterally symmetrical so if we draw a midline we'll f we will find that the mesoincisal angle is sharp as you can see here while the distoincisal angle is rounded and it's, much, it's, it's a little bit lower this one is round this one is a little bit sharp so and the distal one is a little bit lower uh, than the meso one lower toward the, the cervix the lingual and mesial aspects they are identical to that of the central the distal aspect is just more of the incisal edge is visible and the cemento enamel junction is less pronounced from the incisal aspect if we draw a line that follows the incisal edge and the line that bisects you can see that distally it's not 90 degrees because the incisal edge just have have a it's have a like uh, an angle it's not straight like in the central incisor the distal incisal edge just goes a little bit toward the lingual side the pulp is similar to that in the central to explain more this uh, incisal edge axis we can see it much more better in this uh, picture this line shows the axis of the incisal edge and see it's not perpendicular to the long axis or to the labiolingual axis of the tooth and this is one of the features this is the most important feature that we can use to know the right from the left but because of the incisal edge twisting to the labial uh, side The cingulum is also going to be a little bit shifted and don't uh, forget that the distal incisal uh, line angle and the distal uh, height of contour are different these both help us to know the right from the left also the variations in this tooth are really rare it is interesting to know that incisors uh, in other species are really uh, having much more differences than they do in humans for example they differ in function and morphology in the fur comping and lemurs tree shopping in certain rodents and meat stripping in the carnivores are very specialized functions of incisors in rodents incisors are deeply implanted in the jaws they are curved continue to grow throughout life the enamel is limited to the labial surface in life the diastem between the incisors and molars is filled by the cheeks and tongue effectively creating separate incising and grinding chambers there, uh, there is a sphincter muscle to facilitate this action. In the lagomorphs, the rabbits and hares have a very small second incisors immediately behind the main one on each side. You know, these informations are just interesting to mention, but they will not, they will not be uh, included in your exam.
The lemurs, as you can see, have a comp like lower incisors adapted to grooming a paramysticatory function or adaptation. The II, unlike humans and the majority of living primates, have two upper and two lower incisors in each quadrant of the jaw. A curious adaptation in the II of Madagascar is the acquisition of continuously growing rodent-like incisors. In sheep, they have no upper anterior teeth at all. There is instead a horny pad, which means the six lower incisors and two canines, to crop the grass on which the animal feeds. The remnants, such as cows, crop and swallow. Later, they uh, regregate re the content of the cecum to show their cut. A large volume of saliva buffers and protects the teeth. The most extreme adaptation is the Mondon, the Norway. It is a rare example of a unilateral tooth. In the adult male, there is a large left incisor which reaches a length of 9 to 12 feet and is grooved in a left-handed spiral. The one to the right is vestigial. Rare male have two tusks, the incisors tusks of female calcify, but do not erupt and thus remains edentulous. It has no other teeth besides the tusks. The narwhal has another distinction. It is the most extreme example of dental sexual dysmorphism in mammals. The largest incisors are the tusks of elephants and their extant relatives. The mammoth and mastodon which died out at the end of the last ice age. The tusk incisors grow from persistent pulps and continue to grow throughout life. They have an enamel tip upon eruption. However, cement covers the remainder of the crown part of the tusk and extends into the root. The other tusks have deciduous predecessors. Horses. They have three incisors per quadrant. Their unusual design and wear throughout life permit their use in judging the age of the animal. When the teeth first erupt, they have a central pit. With wear, the enamel becomes worn off the area around the pit so that the enamel bordering the central, the mark, becomes isolated from the enamel of the crown surface by exposed dentine. With further wear, the bottom of the pit is reached and passed, so that in old animals, the central pit of the occlusal surface is made up of secondary dentine filling in the roof of the pulp cavity. Well, I hope that you found it that really interesting, <laughs> and uh, I would recommend you also to go back to the book to see the sizes uh, and the dimensions of the mandibular central incisor as you are going and the lateral of course as you are going to carve the central incisor in the lab go back and see some uh, of the illustrations and photos there is a special uh, relationship that is described between the maxillary and the mandibular incisors. These relationships are going to be uh, explained in details in the lectures of occlusion you are going to take. But I'm just going to give you a hint or a small explanation about them so you will be familiar with them. So the maxillary and the mandibular incisors occlude with each other in the mouth. You can see that. Uh, simply by closing your teeth and looking at them in the mirror. We have different way of these teeth to occlude with each other. So they, we can see class 1, 2, 3 relationships between the maxillary and the mandibular incisors. And sometimes we can see 
I will I will come to that later. <clears throat> so the the space or the area that the teeth come into horizontally is the object where they uh, both um, share this area and the area where the teeth share vertically is the overbite this the area that they both come into occlusion that will be explained in details in the occlusion lectures so this is the overbite here and this is the overjet and if the maxillary incisor comes behind the mandibular like this we call it a reverse overjet if the maxillary incisors and the mandibular incisors come into contact that is the overjet and overbite are between 2 to 3 millimeters we call it class 1 like here if the maxillary are furthermore forward labially it's class 3, 2 if they come into contact edge to edge or the maxillary is be in the uh, beyond the uh, mandibular we call it, call it a class 3 of course there is variations of these classes but I'm not gonna talk about them here I'm just giving you a hint about the incisal relationship classes the details will be given in the occlusion lecture as you can see this is the overjet the horizontal overlapping distance between the uh, maxillary and mandibular incisors as you can see in this patient you can't see the lower incisors because the overbite is too, de too deep here you can see there is no overjet between these two teeth there is moderate or class 1 and this is excessive or class 2 this is a moderate overbite which means the over as you can see here the overbite the uh, distance where the teeth overlap class 1 and here as you can see it's small if, if there is no overbite at all this will be called an open bite open bite The sequence of teeth shedding will be given to you in the deciduous dentition lecture. Of course, you are demanded to go back to the your book and see the chronology of tooth development and the order of eruption. You have to know where did the teeth erupt, where is, when was the first evidence of calcification of each tooth, when the, the crown completed and when is the root completed. You can find these tables in the uh, reference book of this uh, course, which is the Wheeler's Dental Anatomy. Also, what you can find there is uh, some schedules and tables at the end of the book that summarize all the arch traits, the type traits we have been talking about throughout the lectures. They are summarized in these tables. They help you actually to uh, learn the differences between teeth. You can go back to them, they will help you doing that. So that was all for today's lectures. I hope uh, you enjoyed it and till we see it uh, till, till the next lecture. Next lecture will be about maxillary and mandibular canines. I wish you all the luck and goodbye.